Hi, everyone. We are now going to take a look at chapter 14. And let me just get my presentation here up and so you can see it. So I have the PowerPoint. I'm not thrilled with the author's PowerPoint. So I also have my book because I want to take a look at the specific examples and just walk you through them. And hopefully this will help you wrap your head around, maybe answer some questions that you, you are having or struggling with, with this chapter. So this chapter is all about determining what is the proper amount of debt and equity a company should have. And your author likes to call it the pie model. And that's because if you think of debt and equity, the two major sources of value that a firm gets, basically from an accounting perspective and a finance perspective, that's where a company gets money for assets. So all the assets or the value of those assets can be defined in terms of debt and or equity. So what composition of debt and equity should a firm have um, that is proper. What are the deciding factors? Once we talk about that a little bit, then we're going to look at what's this thing of homemade leverage? What's the idea of that? And how does it affect the value of a firm? We're going to look at um, capital structure theories, the MM theories, one and two, from a without tax perspective, and then taking into account tax rates and how they affect um, how we leverage or take on debt. And then we're going to compute, show you how to compute the value of the unlevered firm. So a firm with no debt and a levered firm, a firm with some debt. So that's, that's what we're accomplishing. And that's just the outline. The M&M propositions are there. So again, here is your capital structure or your composition of equity, which was signified as S. So that's the market value of your S equity stocks. And then the market value of your debt is represented with the B. So that's you know, um, loans and just borrowings. So that's the two major entities that provide value to a firm. Now, how much debt should you use to finance the firm as related to equity? Now, I'm following along in your book because I like some of the examples and they're not illustrated on the PowerPoint. So bear with me. And then we'll look at a different example on the PowerPoint, which is, so there's two important questions when we're trying to determine debt versus equity or both. We need to make sure that we maximize shareholder value, okay? So stockholders, why do they care about maximizing firm value Sometimes we look and we go, that, um, this is on page 424. Value of the firm overall is the sum of both debt and equity, right? Maybe instead sh stockholders shouldn't focus on the value of the firm, but what maximizes their own interests. So what is the proper ratio of debt to equity that maximizes it? Okay. And if you look through the example at the bottom of that page, take really quick. Suppose the market value of the JJ Sprint company is a thousand. So equity and debt together is a thousand. It has no debt. So that means all market value is in equity. 
They have 100 shares of stock that sell for $10 a share. So that's the market value of the stock. A company such as JJ Sprint with no debt is called an unlevered company. All, it's financed all with equity. What if the company plans to borrow $500 and pay the $500 proceeds immediately as a dividend of $5 a share to the shareholders? After the issuance of the debt, the firm becomes levered. Now it's not keeping any of that cash, it's paying it right out. So the value of the firm should stay at $1,000. Will it? Let's see. The investments of the firm will not change as a result of the transaction. What will the value of the firm be after the proposed restructuring? Well, no debt, they have zero debt, and $1,000 in equity. Could you let him outside? Let's look at scenario one. If the firm value after the restructuring increases, so debt is at 500, equity is at 750. Let's say it goes down to 750. The firm value will increase to 1250. The second scenario says it stays at 1000. So 500 in debt, 500 in equity. And then the third scenario says, what if it becomes less than 1,000? So it could end up at 750. Well, the debt is 500 and the equity then would have a value of 250. It goes on to say, note that the value of equity is below 1,000 under any of the three possibilities. First, why does this happen? The table shows the value of the money after the extra cash dividend is paid. So there is no increase in value of the firm from the cash. In the event of stock, in the event of future liquidation, stockholders will be paid only after bondholders have been paid in full. Thus the debt, those any kind of debt payment will go to the people holding the debt first. It's just how it is. Now, there's a lot of different outcomes that could have occurred. They're just focused on these three. So I don't want you to say, oh, those are the only three that could happen. So what can be the ultimate payoff to the shareholders under these three conditions? Remember capital gains. That's how much money they'll make if they sell their stock. Okay, so if capital gains are negative $250 and dividends are 500, the overall gain to the stockholder is 250. So you see that equity line there. So if capital gains are 500 under scenario two, that's negative 500. Okay. Um, 500 dividends, a zero overall gain. In scenario three, when capital gains are determined to be negative 750, dividends are 500, there's an overall loss to the shareholders. Okay. So what does this mean? Imagine that outcome three is felt to be the most likely case. In this case, the company shouldn't restructure because it will cause stockholders to have an overall loss. But if scenarios one or two are felt to be the ones that will happen, then they should move forward with borrowing that money it will not affect the stockholders. So what do we get out of this? We need to take the outcome that increases that shareholder situation. So that's what it says. Managers should choose the capital structure that they believe will have the highest 
firm value because this is what will be most beneficial to the firm's stockholders. So at that 1000 value or the 1250 value, okay, if we feel that's what's going to happen, that's the one we want to take. So let's look at this example. Here again, you have assets of 20,000 and this firm currently is 100% financed with equity. There's 400 shares that are currently outstanding and they sell for $50 a share. So if you take 50 times 400, you'll get $20,000. The company proposes to do this. They want to finance the company with $8,000 debt and equity of 12,000. So as it says there, maybe some of the original shareholders want to cash out. So they're gonna sell. So they're not gonna keep that 20,000 in equity, they're shifting. So in other words, they're gonna borrow $8,000 to buy out the stock of 8,000. Now we have a debt to equity ratio, okay? For every $2 of debt, there's $3 of equity. So, um, two to three. Interest rate for the debt is 8%. Now the number of shares that are outstanding, if you take 12,000 divided by 50, you get 240. So the number of shares that are outstanding are only 240. That's the number that are sold because they bought some, some of the shareholders cashed out with that debt and the share price is still at $50 a share. So this is the expectation. Earnings before um, interest and taxes in a recession would be $1,000. The expected um, is 2,000 and if there's expansion, 3,000. So we have at expected, worse off, better off, okay? There is no interest under the current structure because there is no debt. So net income would be $1,000, 2,000 and 3,000. Earnings per share, remember we take the net income divided by the outstanding shares. So 250 for recession, 2,000 divided by 400 for the expected, Set um, 3,000 divided by the 400 for the 750. Return on assets. That would be the 1,000 net income divided by the $20,000 value of assets. Sorry, my dog is drinking. Oops. Return on equity would be the same amount because um, equity is at 20,000 as well. So you would take the net income divided by total assets for ROA, net income divided by total equity for ROE. And you could see those percentages. Now, what if we did the proposed expansion or the uh, debt? Well, now you have debt of $8,000. I forget the interest rate already. It's the only thing that stinks about these, let me, um, Go back, go back, 8%. You should know that, right? So 8,000 times 8%, there's gonna be $640 of interest. Now remember, we're not worried about taxes yet. We're pretending there's no taxes. So net income under this situation in the recession would be 360, expected would be 1360 and expansion 2360. Earnings per share, now remember outstanding shares have decreased. So 360 divided by 240 would give us the $1.50 in earnings per share. Do the same thing with the expected and the expansion using 240 in your denominator for earnings per share. Return on assets would be the 360 divided by 20,000 or 1.8% for the recession. 1360 divided by 20,000, 2360 divided by 11.8. 
Now our return on equity will be different because our equity is now only at 12,000. So we're gonna take the 360 divided by 12,000 to get a 3%, 1360 divided by 12,000. So if we plotted these, this is on page 427, a similar graph. If we plotted these answers, the solid red line is earnings per share and our earnings before interest and taxes with no debt. Okay, so at a thousand dollars, let me grab it. I had printed it out. I'm sorry, I have to refer back. Where is it? Ah. Let me find my. Oh, there it is. Instead of me skipping back and forth, so thousand dollars in a recession with no debt would yield an earnings per share of about $2.50, so around there. At $2,000, it would yield about a $5 earnings per share, and then at $3,000, $7.50. Now, the dotted line is earnings per share and EBIT with debt, with the proposed debt structure, so at $1,000, the earnings per share would be about a buck 50. So we're looking around there. $2,000, it would be about 567. And then $3,000, 983. And you could see the break even point is where about our, um, our EBIT is probably around like a little bit more than $1,500 and about $4 of earnings per share. Okay. That's where our lines cross. Here's what this graph demonstrates. When your EBIT is less than the break-even point, okay, your earnings per share, if you take on debt, will be less than your earnings per share with no debt. So there's a disadvantage to taking debt. However, when your EBIT is above the break-even point, your earnings per share tend to be higher with taking on debt in your capital structure than without taking it. And that's what this illustrates. So it may be okay for you. It may make sense for the company to take on this debt because it's going to give more earnings per share for the stockholders. So that's what this first scenario on pages 426 to 427 is illustrating. So now the question becomes, okay, how do you um, create the proper debt? We know it's probably okay to put debt in there going to increase shareholders' earnings per share, increase value for the shareholders if the earnings before um, interest and taxes amount is above break-even. And that's the key is finding that break-even point. Now, we have to have homogenous expectations, homogenous risk classes. So we're, we're keeping things very straightforward here and a perpetual cash flow. That's some of the assumptions in this model. Also, perfect capital markets. There's perfect competition. Firms and investors can both borrow and lend at the same rate. So you can see there's a lot of theory here. We all have access to the same information. There's no transaction costs and there's no taxes. Now, what this MM model or proposition does is provides an argument, and this is on page 428, that a firm 
cannot change the total value of its outstanding securities by changing their capital structure. So in other words, your stock value, you can't change that overall value. The company cannot change it by changing how much debt they have versus equity. And that's what this model shows. So I'm going to draw you to page 428 to look at this. And we could, we'll could. also take a look at the example that they put on the PowerPoints. But take a look. What the MM proposition, so we have, I can't even pronounce that first name, Modigliani, maybe I did it, and Miller. We call it the M&M or MM proposition one. It says, just look at a simple strategy of strategy A and B. So we have here, strategy one. A company or a, a, a shareholder, so we're looking at this from the shareholder's perspective. They buy 100 shares of levered equity, meaning the company has debt. Now, if we use the same information from table 14.3 on the previous page, okay, remember earnings per share at the top of the page there, we didn't go through this example, but it was similar to what we did on that last few slides. If the company's levered, the earnings per share will be zero at a recession, $4 at expected, and $8 at expansion. Now remember, the shareholder, when they're buying um, stock, they want to know what are the earnings per share? What are my um, amounts that I'm going to get out of this? So at a levered firm, remember, earnings per share are zero, four, and eight. The initial cost of the debt is 100 shares times $20 a share. And I think that's given, yes. And that's given in table 14.1. So if you buy 100 shares at $20 a share, you pay $2,000. How much earnings will you have on that 100 shares? Zero if it's a recession, 400 if it's expected, expansion 800. So it all depends on where the firm falls. But we're just looking at this to show you that it doesn't matter what kind, if a, if a shareholder borrows money to buy stock or if a corporation buys money. Homemade leverage, and that's what this is. The shareholder goes and borrows $2,000 from either a bank or a brokerage house. And they use those proceeds to immediately buy $2,000 more in stock. So strategy B, what is the cost to the shareholder? Whoops, I hope you can hear me. I covered my microphone there. Earnings per 200 shares in the current unlevered Trans Am. So the company isn't taking on more debt here, the shareholder is. So if they buy 200 more shares, See. Okay, 200 more shares, they're going to earn um, $200 in the unlevered. Unlevered is table 14.2. 14.3 is the earnings per share if there's leverage. So that's when the company borrows money and the shareholder just goes and buys the stock. What if instead the company doesn't borrow the money but the stockholder went and borrowed money to buy more shares of stock? Putting the stockholder in the same type of position. Earnings per share under this would be a dollar for recession, expected $3 and expansion $5. So in this situation, same shareholder will now have $200, $600, and then $1,000 of earnings. They will also pay interest, though, on the money, 10% on $2,000 loan. It tells us that 
within the problem. So under the first scenario, and second, and third, it's a $200 interest payment. So what is their actual earnings if they do homemade leverage? Well, under the first, zero. They bought 200 shares that have a dollar of earnings per share in a recession, and they have to pay $200. So no matter if the company borrows the money up above, or the shareholder says, no company, don't borrow the money, I'll borrow the money and buy stock. I'll, so in other words, I'll, I'll borrow the money instead of you, I'll pay the interest instead of you, I'll just give you that money. So then you don't have to borrow anymore. So the company's still getting the money in the end. It's the same scenario though, financially, for the stockholder. What if the company did go out and borrow like they did in strategy A? What's the return to the shareholder in a leveraged firm, 400? What if instead the shareholder went, borrowed the money and gave it to the company by buying more stock so the company didn't have to borrow any money? Well, overall to the shareholder, it's the same amount, 400. They might get 600 in earnings, but they had to pay 200 in interest. And, the same, and then you could see the final scenario. So it doesn't matter if the company borrows the money or if the shareholder borrows it personally and gives it to the company through buying more stock. Overall to the shareholder, the value of the leveraged firm is the same as the value of the unleveraged firm. Take a look at this example. Here's earnings per share of the unleveraged firm. So we're using and it would have been nice, like even if you at some point stop and go back and print out these points of the PowerPoint. In the unlevered firm, in a recession, the earnings per share were 250. So if you buy 40 shares, if you buy 40 shares of stock with $500, your earnings per share and earnings for a recession would be 100. And this is on the unlevered firm. Expected, it would be $5 in the unlevered firm and your earnings per share would be, I'm sorry, your total earnings would be $200, five bucks times 40 shares. And then the expansion would be earnings per share of 750 as an unlevered firm. $300 would be your earnings. If you, so you're saying to the company, don't take on any debt, okay? I'll give you the money, I'll borrow the money personally. This is what the shareholder's doing. So the company is still unlevered. But what does the stockholder, stockholder do? They borrow $800 to buy these new shares of stock and this is charging them 8% interest. So the overall interest payment under each economic situation will be $64. So in a recession, the profit would be $36 to the shareholder. In the expected, 136. And in the expansion, 236. If we took their return on equity, okay, now what it would be their return on equity? Well, the return on equity would be 12, um, would be the net profits divided by their equity. They borrow 2,000, I'm sorry, they pay 2,000, so that's their total equity, but 800 of it was from borrowed funds. So 36, the profit under the first scenario divided by the 1200, the part that represents equity is 3% to the shareholder. If you go back to the slide where we calculated return on equity, if there was leverage, so if the company went and borrowed money, I think it was $2,000, or $8,000 in total. But their return on equity would be 3%. Let's 
Let's look at this from the stockholder's perspective again. The stockholder has 136 in profit divided by their investment in equity of 1,200. Their return on equity be 11.3%. The same as the companies, if the company went out and borrowed money. So from a stockholder's perspective, it just doesn't matter. If they go and borrow the money and buy more stock and keep the company unleveraged, or if the company goes and borrows the money and has part leverage, part unleveraged. Okay. Um, all right, so I think, I think we get the point there. So there is the value of the firm does not change. Now, let's take a look at the next scenario, which is proposition two. And this starts on page 430. Again, not really looking at taxes. And proposition two from M&M says, leverage though, increases the risk so once you start taking on debt, now there's more risk. And because of that, there's more, there should be a higher return to the stockholders. Okay. And if you look on page 430, it says, if you noticed, and I'm going to refer you back to earnings per share. You go back to page 427. Take a look at the bottom of page 426. Earnings per share under those three distinct economics conditions. What we expect, what will happen if there's a recession, what will happen if there's expansion. Earnings per share changed over about a $4 range. Not a huge amount. A smaller amount overall than the top of page 427, where earnings per share in a leverage goes from $0 to $8. So a much wider gap, more volatility there. So this greater range implies a greater risk because what look at your risk there. You could get $0, you could get $4, you could get $8. Or if it's unleveraged, it's one to five. So you might say, well, that's a lot, but it's not as much as if when it's levered. And that's the key, given the same inputs. So levered stockholders, stockholders that are invested in companies that are leveraged, have better returns in good times, okay, because of that risk but they also have worse returns in bad times. And just compare that. In good times, the levered person gets $8, the unlevered gets five. But in bad times, recession, the levered gets zero and the recession unlevered get a dollar. So we prove that. So, Proposition two focuses on what is the required return to equity holders? And where will it go? How much, you know, where will it end up? What's the rise because of this risk, because of leverage? So I'm gonna go back to page 431. And of course, we come back to our weighted average cost of capital. That's really where we begin. So let's just review that quick. S is the value of the stock. So we divide that by the value of the debt, B, plus the value of the stock, S. And it's a B because they assume it's bonds. We then times that by the return, the required rate of return on the stock. We're gonna be finding that in this scenario, but we start with the weighted average cost of capital to get us there. We add to that then 
the ratio of debt, so it would be debt over debt plus equity, times the cost of debt, which is RB. Okay, so that is our weighted average cost of capital. Now, we could do all kind of fancy footwork there, and we could um, convert that into, well, the required return of equity when there's leverage is the return on equity on unlevered equity plus the debt to equity ratio times the return on unlevered equity minus the return, or I should say the cost of debt. So we just transposed the weighted average cost of capital to get this formula, which calculates this needs to be the return on equity when we have this much debt to equity and given the cost of debt. Oh, I didn't mean to go back there. Okay, hit the wrong key. I guess I hit the home key. All right, so there it is. There's all the transposition and everything to get to that. <laughs> we don't need to work through all that. Um, so I'm just gonna come here and I'm gonna go back into your book. Page 432. I'm going to go down to the MM proposition to no taxes. So again, your return on unlevered capital plus your debt to equity times your unlevered capital cost minus, or I should say your return for unlevered equity, so when your company has no debt, minus the return for debt. And given the example in the book, I'm not looking at this slide yet, it says, okay, if 15% is your return on equity when it's an unlevered company, and they calculated that up in the top using the example that's been throughout this chapter. So let me take you back to page 426. So if your expected earnings are 1,200 and your equity is 8,000, totally unleveraged, your cost of equity um, when it's unlevered equity or the return on unlevered equity, remember those are synonymous, is 15%. Plug it into your calculation. So if we take 15% plus the total debt, so now we're looking at scenario, okay, what will be the new required return on equity if we add this debt in? So they're proposing half debt, half equity, times that unlevered return on equity minus that 10% cost of debt, which is given in the problem. So what's the new required return on equity in a levered company? 20%. If it stays levered, 15. Unlevered, I mean 15. If it becomes, um, has debt incorporated into it, now you're looking at a higher required return. And it's because you're taking on risk. That's why it'll be higher. So on page 432 is the graph depicting this relationship. So RB is constant because your required or I should say your return on debt or cost of debt is constant. Your RS, the cost of equity, will increase though as your weighted average cost of capital changes. 
Okay, and that's what that's depicting. So if your cost of equity stays at RO, which is unlevered, it's constant. Your weighted average cost of capital would be constant and that is constant. But when you're incorporating more debt, now your required return increases. And that's all that's shown. Great example on the next three pages. And I don't wanna get this um, discussion going too crazy for you, but I did wanna walk through it and then show you some stuff with taxes. Just to once again, really put your head around this MM proposition. And when companies are deciding, should we do debt? Should we just do equity? Should we do a combination? Overall, the value of the firm doesn't really change. And the stockholder's position doesn't really change. However, they are gonna require a higher rate of return on their equity because it is taking on risk. So we have here, Luteran Motors, an all equity firm has expected earnings of 10 million per year in perpetuity. So forever. The firm pays all of its earnings out as dividends. So that the 10 million may also be viewed as the stockholders expected cash flow in perpetuity. There's 10 million shares outstanding. So that means their annual cash flow per share is $1. This is important. Cost of capital for this unlevered firm is 10%. In addition, the firm will soon build a new plant for 4 million. Where do they get the money from? And that's what this comes down to. Now we need to know more about this plant. It's expected to generate additional cash flow of 1 million per year. So using this information, we're going to now start creating a balance sheet from a finance perspective and see what will happen with how we finance this $4 million. The first part is take a look at this balance sheet in the middle of the page. First, let's find the present value, so the market value of the cash flow on the old assets. Cash flow on the old assets is 10 million a year. If we divide that by 10%, a perpetuity calculation, our old assets have a value of 100 million. That means our equity is worth 100 million. Okay, now we're not doing this from an accounting perspective, we're doing this from a finance. Let's go down to the bottom. Imagine that the firm announces that the, in the near future, it needs to raise $4 million in equity to build a new plant. Now the stock price and therefore the value of the firm will rise to reflect the positive net present value of the plant. Now, remember in our discussion in chapter 13, efficient markets will immediately react to this without even selling any of the stock. So let's look how our balance sheet will change. What is the net present value of the plant? Well, it's a cash outlay of negative 4 million immediately plus the cash flow present value of 1 million in perpetuity. So $6 million overall. So the balance sheet will increase from a finance perspective to 106 million. So will the stock because the market will react immediately. So the value of the stock is up to 106, even though 10 million are still outstanding. It's just the price per share is now, value of them are $10.60 each. Immediately thereafter you sell, and raise $4 million. If you sell and raise $4 million, this is the next paragraph down, you're selling them for 1060 a share, you sold an additional 377,358 shares. Go to the middle balance sheet. Your company now has 100 million old asset value, 6 million in the new plant value and 4 million in cash. So a total asset of 110 million, your equity is at 110 million.
when the plant is built, okay, the present value of the plant will be the 1 million divided by 10%, okay? The plant's already built, so 10 million and our 110 million in value in equity. So that's if you totally financed it with equity. That's what should happen. Take a look now what happens if we finance part of it with debt. What if instead you announce you're going to borrow $4 million at 6% to build the new plant? So you're going to pay about $240,000 in interest. The stock price will immediately rise to reflect positive net present value of the plant. So it's going to go along the same course as it did with equity. We already talked about what it, why it, it immediately reacts. It's just market efficiency. But then at some point, you're going to borrow that $4 million. That $4 million doesn't get added to the equity. It's debt. But the overall value of the assets is still $110 million, And the value of the firm, debt plus equity, is $110 million. Now you have 6 million in equity, 4 million in debt. But the value of the equity is at 106. You didn't sell any more equity. It's just the price went up. There's still 10 million shares. So what's the price per share? $10.60. Even though you took on $4 million in debt. Now, if we turn to the next page, it says the only change here is that the bank account has been depleted to pay the contractor. The expected yearly cash flows after interest will be 10 million from the old assets plus a million from the new assets, but minus 240,000 in interest. So the equity holders are expecting a return under this scenario to be 10.15%. 10,760,000 divided by their 106 million of value. Okay. Under the levered, what is their expected return? 10 million, if you go back to page 435, top of the page, 10 million in old assets plus a million in new assets, they don't subtract any of the interest because there's no debt. And all of the value is in equity. So divide that by 110 million. So under the levered, unlevered, your return, expected return on equity is 10%. But under the levered, it's higher, 10.15%. So this example, and one of the reasons I ran through it, is to show these propositions all work out. We prove proposition one here. The overall value of the firm doesn't change. And proposition two, that there's ex an expected higher return when there's leverage than when there isn't. Okay, final area, taxes. In the book and in life, we have to worry about taxes, okay? Now, how do we incorporate taxes into our discussion and how, how do we do our problems? Well, on page 438, let's go back to our pie. When we're in an all equity firm, you could see there's a pretty large chunk of taxes. But when we incorporate debt into our capital structure, because interest is tax deductible, our taxes tend to be less. So that's what this picture is showing us. Now, on page 439, do I want to do that one really? Let's take a look at example 
we can talk about these um, calculations. The Water Products Company has a corporate tax rate of 21%, earnings before interest and taxes of 1 million each year. Its entire earnings after taxes are paid out as dividends. The firm is considering two alternative capital structures, one with no debt and one with debt of 4 million. Here's how things would work out cash flows wise to the people financing the company. Plan one, $1 million of income before interest and taxes, 21% tax rate would mean a 210,000 tax. The difference, pay the shareholders 790,000, total payouts 790,000. But what if we have financing with debt and equity? Well, 1 million overall in earnings before interest and taxes. Deduct interest that's paid to the debt holders. 400,000. So our tax taxable income will be 600,000. 21% of 600,000 is 126,000. That gets paid to the government. When we subtract that, the dividends that will be paid because we pay all of this out to the shareholders is 474,000. So how much in total payments were made to both groups, 400,000 for interest and 474,000 for dividends. So overall, we paid out a total of 874,000 when we have debt. So this is just showing you that more money will go out to the people financing, either through, you know, in this case, the debt holders, the debt people will receive money and the stockholders, but overall more will go out than just having an unlevered company. So when we have corporate taxes, firm value increases with leverage. So the overall firm value when you have leverage is the unleverage plus the tax savings from your interest. In proposition two, equity risk and return is offset by the tax shield given from interest and tax shield is tax savings. And this is illustrated on page 439. So interest, of course, is your interest rate times the amount you borrow. The tax shield is how much you save on your taxes from that interest. So if you take your ta corporate tax rate times the interest, that's how much you're saving. So if we take, so how much is our required return, equity return, when you have corporate taxes? Here's your required cost of capital unlevered plus your debt to equity ratio, debt over equity, multiplied by one minus your tax rate, multiplied by, so you're, you're putting into account the taxes, your unlevered equity cost minus your debt cost or interest rate on your debt. So let's take a look at an example of this on page 440. Do I want to do that one? I don't want to explain anything else there.
Okay. No, I think we're okay. Um, that is that. Let's go to page 440. Example, Dividend Airlines is currently an unlevered firm. The company expects to generate 126.58 in earnings before interest and taxes in perpetuity. The corporate tax rate is 21%, implying after-tax earnings is $100. Okay, so if you take 126.58 times 21%, you get 26.58. 126.58 minus 26.58 will give you after-tax earnings of $100, and they're all paid out as dividends. The firm is considering a capital restructuring to allow $200 of debt. Its cost will be 10% of debt capital. Unlevered firms in the same industry have a cost of equity of 20%. What will the new value of dividend airlines be? Now, its value as an unlevered firm is 500. Okay. And we get that by taking this, it, this is on page 439. Their earnings before interest and taxes times one minus the tax corporate rate. So 126.58 times 0.79 is $100. Divide that by the cost of equity of an unleveraged firm, which is 20%. So you get $500 plus the corporate tax rate times the debt. So 200 times 0.21 gives us $42. So the value of this firm is $500, the cost of, um, or the, the present value of the equity of the unleveraged firm, which will be your cash flow in perpetuity divided by your cost of equity. Okay, and that's after tax cash flow. Plus, the um, cash savings of having debt. So that's tax savings, which would be the 21% times $200 or 42. So the value of the levered for firm is greater than the unlevered firm. So we're showing you here how taxes change that value. Before no taxes, it didn't matter. But once you incorporate taxes into this, now the value of the firm will be higher for a levered company than from an unlevered. Let's look at the expected return. And that's what we're doing in there. This is the expected return and how that changes for Proposition 2 when you incorporate taxes. Crazy stuff here, right? So let's take a look at page 441, so we could explain this. So here is your formula. What is your expected return? We saw it two slides ago. Again, it is your cost of capital from an unlevered firm plus your debt to equity ratio times one minus your tax rate times your, re your return on equity from an unlevered firm minus your um, cost of debt, your basically your interest rate on your debt. So if we apply this formula to divided airlines, we get, we know their cost of capital for an unlevered firm is 20%. That's given in example 14.4. Their amount of debt is 200. 
their amount of equity will be 542 minus 200 or 342 times one minus 21% the tax rate times um, the uh, cost of capital unleveraged minus the uh, cost of debt or the interest rate on the debt, 10%. So the return on equity for a leveraged firm because of risks, even with taxes, will be at 24.62%. So whenever your cost of capital as an unleveraged firm is greater than your cost of debt. And that's what's depicting in this graph down below in figure 14.6. So whenever RO is greater than your cost of debt, which would be the 0.079, your expected return on equity increases. Okay, so we're just depicting that. Ooh, that's a lot of stuff, right? So we can go back and <laughs> um, prove all this through our example in our PowerPoint, but I think going through that example, and I know this is probably getting pretty long, um, we, we were able to do that. So take a look and see if you can figure out where these numbers are coming from and to show you that overall, whether you pick debt or equity with taxes, the overall cash flow to the shareholder and the bondholder, whoever gives you the debt and equity will be the same. So the overall earnings made by the company will be the same overall, but it'll be different depending on if you're a stockholder or a bondholder under each scenario, recession expected or expansion. Okay, so I think that's where we're going to stop. Um, just, you know, one more thing, because I know people were saying, wow, weighted average cost of cost capital isn't actually too bad now since chapter 12. So the final thing on page 442, it's just showing you that um, if you take your ratio of equity to total value, so 342 divided by 542 times that expected return of a leveraged firm for equity of 24.62 that we just calculated and add it to your debt to total debt and equity, 200 over 542 times your cost of debt times one minus the tax rate that will end up being your weighted average cost of capital overall. So the weighted average cost of capital was 20% when it wasn't leveraged, now it's 18.5%. Remember that's cost. That's how much it costs you to finance your company. So the lower you can get that, the better. Okay, so this is just some summary and quizzes. And um, remember when you don't have taxes, it doesn't affect the value of the firm. However, um, when you do have taxes, it will. When you, whether you have taxes or not, your cost of equity will be higher when you start incorporating debt into your firm because of the risk associated with it. Okay, and that's just going over these different propositions, okay? So that is chapter 14, the final frontier, guys. Please post your questions on the discussion board.